Okay, so this is Parashas Parashas Vayetze, begins on page 145 in the Art Scroll of Stone Chumash. That is Bereshis, chapter 28, verse 10. So it says, Yaakov departed from Beersheba and went towards Charan. Charan, just to be, um, was the ancest his ancestral homeland. It was in, it's in Aram, Aram Narayim, which is the territory of the Arameans, and that's where the his family came from, and he um he had moved to Orkazdim and then and then went back to Haran and then he's on his way and then he went there. It's the land of Canaan. So now Yaakov, this is talking about Avram. Now Yaakov is going back towards Haran to um to get a wife. And um in the end of last week's parsha, we didn't have a class on that. But at the end of last week's parsha, um. It says that there are two reasons why he left. It says that he stole the blessing. He deceived his father Yitzchak and and um, received blessings from Yitzchak that Yitzchak was intending to give to Esav. And um, Rivka understood that Esav wanted to kill Yaakov, so she told Yaakov, her son, to flee to Lavan and to take refuge there. To um, It should be sanctuary from your... It should be sanctuary from Esav, who wants to kill you. After that, Yaakov, this is on page 143 in the article, from chapter 28, Yaakov summoned, um, summoned Yitzchak, I'm sorry, Yitzchak summoned Yaakov and told him to go to the land of, um, told him to go to Aram to Lavan to find a wife. So he wouldn't find a wife from the um, Hittites. Like um, like like his brother Esav did. Rather, he should go to Lavan and marry from the family. So there are two reasons why he's going, and the Basil Levi says that's why the part this week's parsha one forty five begins. Yaakov departed from Beersheba and went towards Charan. And the commentaries ask, why do you need the departing part? All you need to say is Yaakov went to Charan and he departed wherever he was. Why is the departure important? So Rashi brings to close a message that says that when a righteous person leaves a place, it leaves a mark. And um, and it's not just that he went there; he ended up there. But there was a there was a significant event in the history of Beersheba that Yaakov left Beersheba because even though Avram was still, I'm sorry, um, at this point Yitzchak was still there, where there was a great righteous man who was there. But the fact that a righteous man left that makes a mark. But the Basil Levi says that it's because of those two reasons that we said earlier, that there were two reasons why he left. One was because his mother, um, one was because his mother um, Rivka told him to flee to save his life from Esav. And when a person is fleeing for their life, the destination isn't so important. It's about getting out of getting out of where you were. So the important part as far as following Rivka's um instructions were concerned was departing from Beersheba. But Yitzchak, his father, told him that he should leave to go to Haran to find a wife from his family who aren't um, the Hittites that are around them. So as far as Yitzchak's instructions were, his father's instructions were concerned, what was important is getting to his destination, getting to Haran. So that's why it says both. He said he departed Beersheba following his mother's instructions to escape from Esav. And he went towards Haran to follow to follow his father's instructions to find a wife. Okay. He encountered the place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took from the stones of the place which he arranged around his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamt, and behold, the ladder was set earthward, and unto the top reached heavenwards, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, Hashem was standing over him, and he said, I am Hashem, God of Avram, your father and God of Yitzchak. The ground upon which you are lying to you I will give unto your descendants. Your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth. And he shall spread out powerfully westward, eastward, northward, and southward. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your offspring. Behold, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will return you to the soil. But I will not forsake you until I have done what I have spoken about you. Okay, so he has this beautiful blessing from Hashem. So, um, but the beginning of this, before Hashem was standing over him and gave him this um, guarantee, this promise, he had this vision with his dream, where he saw a ladder was set earthward, its top reached heavenward, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there are a number of explanations given by our sages what exactly the meaning of this dream is, and it seems that they all hinge on the question that they have, which is that it says that 
angels were ascending and descending on it. That you would think that the home where, that, where angels belong is in heaven. So rather than ascending and descending, they would be first descending from where they are in heaven and then ascending, going from earth to heaven. So it seems all the commentaries are bothered, bothered by the order that it says they're first ascending, then and then descending, you would think it would be the opposite. So Rashi quotes a medrash that, um, that he was, right now, Yaakov was leaving the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the Holy Land, and going outside the land of Israel. And, he's, and he says that the angels a person has accompanying them are different when they're in the land of Israel and when they're out of the land of Israel. So... Um, so these angels ascending were the angels that are guarding him, that protected him in the land of Israel, and the angels descending are new angels that are coming down to protect him in the um in Chutzlaretz in um in exile. Um, there's a medrash though that's quoted by um extensively by the Ramban that these angels were actually um that these were he was seeing the future and he was seeing all the angels that will, all the nations, I should say, that would rule over his descendants, the Jewish people. And the, he was seeing their the angelic spirit, the, the spiritual embodiment of those nations. And first, it was the nation of, um, the nation of, I'd like to say, um, Bavel, of Babylon, that was, um, that was, that was the nation that, con I mean, I, I guess it would be Egypt, and then Greece, and that um so um so they ascended and that ascending was symbolic of them becoming powerful and um and dominating the world and they ascended and each one ascended until the next one ascended and threw that through the um the one ahead of them down so that was the ascending and descending so let's say um Greece ascended and then they were th th or I'm a little out of order let's say um Babylon ascended and then they were thrown down by the Persians and Medes. And as the Persians and Medes ascended, so they were, um, so then they were thrown down by, who succeeded them? Um, by, by the Greeks. And then the Greeks, as the Greeks ascended, they were thrown down by the Romans, which is the descendants of Aesop. And then Yaakov saw that the, the spiritual embodiment of Aesop of Rome, Western civilization, just kept ascending and ascending and ascending. And he said, is this going to go forever that they're going to dominate my sons, my descendants? And Hashem said, even if I have to go to the ends of the earth, I'll, um, I'll bring Esau down and the Jewish people will, in the end, is symbolized by their birth where Yaakov was hanging on to Esau's heel as he was born. That means that he's going to, going to follow Esau in, um, in, in being the um, dominate, dominant power in the world. Okay. The Malbim has one other understanding, and that is that what's this ladder representing? That it's a ladder set earthward and its top reached the heavenward. And um, our sages say that where was he? He was at the um, Temple Mount. And this means that he was in the place of the Akedah, he was in the place of the binding of his father Yitzchak, which is the Har Maria, the, the Temple Mount. And this ladder going from the earth to the heaven at the temple represented the Mizbeach, the altar, where we bring offerings that go heavenward and Hashem sends blessing down to us as a, as a result of those offerings that we bring to Hashem. And that's the angels going, um, going upwards, ascending are the angels carrying our prayers and our service to heaven. And then the angels descending, carrying blessing from Hashem. And in, as you see, when Avram woke up, on, um, Yaakov woke up, I'm sorry, on page 147, it's verse 16, it says, Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, surely Hashem is present in this place and I did not know. He, re he realized what that ladder meant, that that ladder meant this is the place of God, this is the place for Hashem's temple. And he became frightened and said, how awesome is this place, this is none other than the boat of the God and this is the gate, gates of the heaven. And then in verse 18, Yaakov rose early in the morning and took the stone that he placed around his head and set it up as a pillar. And he poured oil on its top and he named that place Basel. However, Luz was the city's name originally. So when Yaakov, according to the Malbim, when Yaakov recognized that this was the place of the temple, the place of the altar, the first thing he did is took a stone 
set set it up as a pillar and pour, poured oil on it. He was setting up the cornerstone of the temple. He wanted to take the first step in building it once he recognized that this was the place. Okay, there's a the Medrash comments. There's a famous Medrash actually that if you look with the stone that he put on his in um, verse eleven, it says he took from the stones of the place which he arranged around his head. He took a bunch of stones and arranged them around his head. The Medrash says there were twelve stones. And then in verse 8, it says Yaakov arose early in the morning and took the stone that he had placed around his head. Now it's singular. It's not plural anymore. Now it's singular. The Medrash says that the stones that he arranged around were fighting about. I, each one wanted to be the one that he laid his head on, so they all merged into one. But um, I saw some of the commentaries say, I think it was Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, that, um, th that these stones represented the... Um, the um, the twelve tribes, and this place, like we says, was the like we said was the Temple Mount, and the Temple Mount was bought by King David from uh, it was the Goran Arnon Hayavusi. It was from the it was the threshing floor of a Arnon, the Jebusite, and um and he bought it with the combined funds of all the twelve tribes, because it it wasn't to be owned by any particular group. This was a um. Like, you know, like they have federal land in the United States. It's owned by the government. It's owned by the people, in a sense. And the Temple Mount wasn't to be, you know, his property, his property. This is the Jewish people's property. It's really God's property, but it's bought um, jointly by the whole community of the Jewish people. And um, that's represented by these 12 stones that later called one stone that um, it, they all con contributed toward the purchase of this area. Okay, so then it continues on verse 20 on page 147. Then Yaakov took a vow and saying, saying, if Hashem will be with me and guard me on this way that I'm going, will give me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I return in peace to my father's house, and Hashem will be a God to me, then the stone which I have set as a pillar shall become a house of God, and whatever you give me, I shall repeatedly tithe it to you. And you see what Yaakov was asking for. He wasn't asking for much. He was asking for, give me bread to eat and clothes to wear. He was saying that he wasn't asking for Hashem for every luxury. He wasn't asking for a boat and a mansion and just give me bread to eat, give me clothes to wear, give me my needs. And that's all he was that's all he was asking for. And this last thing that he says, and Hashem, or in verse the end of 21, it says, and Hashem will be a God to me. What does it mean Hashem will be a God to me? So the Rabbeinu, um it's not the Rabbeinu Bahaya, this is actually the Arachayim comments. That um, in his in his vision in verse thirteen, page one forty five, back there again, it says that he said, "I am Hashem, God of Avram, your father, and God of Yitzchak." Yaakov wanted that as well. He wanted to, to um, be kind of carry God's name and to be um, the, and to be one of those that God's recognized as the God of Yaakov. And um, and that was granted. And that in fact, when we daven, we say. We say, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Yaakov. So this wish, he wanted to be um, a he wanted to be a person that people would um, would would kind of reference God by him. That that's the God of Yaakov, and in fact, that's what happened. Okay, so it continues and chapter twenty nine and page one forty seven. Yaakov lifted his feet and went towards the land of the Easterners. He looked, and uh, Aram is in modern-day Jordan. Um, he looked, and behold, a, um, I think, I don't quote me on that. There might be opinions that's in uh, Turkey, where, wherever it is. It's east of the land of Israel. Um, he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lay there beside it, for from that well they would water the flocks, and the stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks would be assembled, they would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep. Then they would put back the stone over the mouth of the well in its place. So, they it seems that they would um they were afraid of people stealing water so they had a really heavy rock that rested on the well so it would take a big group to uh, move it off so that way nobody could ever take water alone and there was always people watching when when the well was uncovered um so in verse 4 Yaakov said to them my brothers where are you from and they said we are from Haran and he said to them do you know love and son of Nachar? And they said, we know. Then he said, is it, is it well with him? They answered it as well. And see, his daughter Rachel is coming with the flock. 
So the commentary says, why does it say, do you know Lavan, the son of Nachar? Nachar wasn't Lavan's father. Besuel was Lavan's father. Nachar was Lavan's grandfather. He was actually a brother of Terach. It was an uncle of Avraham. Is the castle there? Is he afraid of the right answer? No. So, so they ask why why was he, he why was he asking that? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, the Medra says he was poisoned in last week's partial, yeah. Um or two weeks ago, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. That it, 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 he's in the whole conversation and then he vanishes. It's like he vanishes from the story without explanation. And the Medra says he tried to poison Eliezer, but he was poisoned. He there was they switched the plates. Okay. So anyway, so why is they why are they calling him um, Love on the son of Nachar? So um, the commentaries say, or the Ramban says that he was um, that the question wasn't just. Who is he? Of course they know. He was an important person. You'd expect that they'd know them. His question was, how does he act? What's, what's How are his midas? How is his character? Is he like a son of Basuel, who was known as a very wicked person? Or is he a set, or do, do people consider him a son of Basuel? Or do they consider him a son of Nachar's grandfather, who was an upright person, who was a good man, as they say? And so that's what he... Do you know Basuel... Ben Nachar, do you know if Besua, I'm sorry, do you know Lavan, ben Nach, the son of Nachar, do you know if Lavan is like a son of Nachar? Is he upright like the son of Nachar? And they answered, yes, we know. Okay. And then his daughter Rachel is coming with the flock. And then in verse 7, he said the day is long. And um, in verse 9, while he was speaking with them, Rachel had arrived with her father's flock, for she was a, a shepherdess. And it was when Yaakov saw Rachel, daughter of Lavan, his mother's uh, brother, and the flock of Lavan, his mother's brother, Yaakov came forward and rolled the stone off the mouth of the well and watered the sheep of Lavan, his mother's brother. And that's said over his mother's brother, his mother's brother, to tell us that that's what the important factor was to him at this point, that this is his mother's brother. It's not. It wasn't that he saw um, Rachel and was charmed by her beauty and like, she's the one I married. The first step was, this is family, and this is the one, this is the family I was instructed to go to to find a wife. And everything came after that. Then Yaakov kissed Rachel and raised his voice and wept. Yaakov told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rivka's son, who was her, father, her aunt. Then she ran and told her father. Okay, so this whole story, just as an aside, this whole thing with the shepherds and the rock, like, why is that important? And the Ramban says, this is based on the Medrash, is that um, the well represented the Beis HaMikdash. And the three flocks of sheep represented the um, us going up to be Olul Regal, us to go um, the three times during the year that we would make pil pilgrimages to the Beis HaMikdash. That was Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. And there we would um, be watered by it, and water, the water either means the um, the holiness that we would draw from being at the Beis Hamikdash, or it means the Torah, which goes forth from Zion, from Zion, from from the um, from from Yerushalayim. And it says that it, that doesn't mean that this all didn't literally happen, but this was a kind of a symbol to Av to Yaakov about what was to come with his descendants. Okay, um, okay, in verse thirteen. Page 149, verse 13. And it was when Lavan heard the news of Yaakov, his father's son, his sister's son. He ran towards him, embraced him, kissed him, and took him to his house and recalled to Lavan all these events. The Medrus says that he sa it says he ran towards him, embraced him, and kissed him, that um, he was actually frisking him. All this, uh, like embracing and kissing, was frisking him because he remembered when Eliezer came to look for a shidduch for um for Yitzchak and came to his and brought and carried, brought his sister Rivka as a wife for Yitzchak. He came with all with loaded with wealth. So he was he sees um Yaakov, the son of that of that marriage, he's expecting him to come loaded with wealth again. And now you remember that was given to his sister. Now it'll be given to him as the father of the bride. So he's all excited, but he doesn't see any wealth anymore, anywhere. 
So he was hiding it. So he thought he was hiding it. So he was hugging him and kissing him and frisking him, trying to find it. Yes. So on page 151, and the Medrash says that he that he actually came with wealth, but um, Asaph sent his grandson to, or his Asaph's grandson, Asaph says he sent his grandson to kill him. Alifa, yeah, son or grandson. I was confused with that. Um, to kill him. And um, but instead he um he robbed him, he took everything that he had. This is the matter that um that he took Alifas took everything that Yaakov had, and because if you rob someone until they're destitute, it's like they're dead. It was like killing him. So he came with uh, according to that matter, he came with nothing. And therefore, on page 151, Lavan said to him, Nevertheless, you are my flesh and blood, meaning you're not coming with anything. I was expecting all this wealth. You're here. You're coming with nothing, but still, your family. What could I do? And um, he stayed with him a month's time. Then Lavan said to Yaakov, "Just because you're my relative, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me what are your wages? What should I pay you?" Meaning that, and I think the Ramban says that once, um, once Yaakov saw um, Rachel shepherding the sheep, immediately he said, "That's not right. That she should be doing that." And he took over the shepherding. So Lavan's saying, "I should pay you for that. What should I pay you?" And we'll see Lavan is like the um, the archetype of a swindler, of a con man. And um, a con man never wants someone, a con, man, a con man, first of all, always thinks, is always looking for the angle. He's always looking, since he knows how he thinks, he always thinks so. everyone's thinking like him. And he's always looking for everyone else's con. And, and the last thing a con man wants is to someone to be working for free, because nothing's ever free. And you want the terms to be laid out very clearly because you never know what they're going to end up taking if, uh, if if it's not laid out. So he says, "What am I? What are we going to do? What do I, don't worry, what, what am I going to? What are your wages?" So Levin had two daughters in verse sixteen on page one fifty one. The name of the older one was Leah. The name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah's eyes were tender, while Rachel was beautiful of form and beautiful of appearance. I have a question. Yeah, you don't see this in the Hebrew. Thing. That what? But why is this parenthetic in verse sixteen in English? I why don't. It, why? I mean, why is it a direct statement? Why? Why does this have to be in parentheses as if it's like uh, either further explaining? Or right. Or, it's almost an aside. If you look in, in the, it doesn't fit in the story. It's almost like an aside, and I think that's why it's in parentheses because the story is Lavan said this. And then Yaakov, um, and then it, so it talks about Yaakov mindset. This is like facts. It's almost like it would be a footnote in a story that it's not really part of the narrative. That's why they put it in parentheses. But the Vilna Goen asks, it says here, like you said, Leah's eyes were tender while Rachel is beautiful, form and beautiful of, of appearance. Why is that so important? Like, what's the importance of that? Uh, you know, great righteous man, which King Solomon said in the, in, in, um, Eshes Chayel, a woman of valor, he says, "Sheker achein vehevel ayofi." That chain, that charm, is 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 deceit, and beauty is empty. And Ishi Aras Hashem, he's disal. A woman who fears God, that's who should be praised. So why is why is it like the the Torah express stresses the beauty of Rachel, how she was beautiful of appearance and of form? So the Vilgon answers that beauty does have value. But it only it's an accessory. It only has value when it's put on an appropriate place. If you have a woman who fears Hashem and is of good character, so then beauty is is a is a beautiful thing on there. But if you have someone who's empty on the inside, someone who's a wicked woman, a um a, someone who's lacking in character, so he says, then it's like lipstick on a pig. It's it's grotesque when it's applied on when when there's ugliness on the inside, the beauty on the outside is grotesque. It's only when there's be there's beauty on the inside, the in the outside reflects the beauty on the inside. That's where beauty is valuable. Okay. Um, so in verse eighteen, Yaakov loved Rachel, so he said, "I'll work for you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter." And notice how he specified that. I will work for you for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. He didn't just say for Rachel, because he knew that 
Lavan was always working an angle, so he might work for seven years and then end up with a different Rachel. And if he said your daughter, he would get a um he would get um the other daughter, Leah. And if he said Rachel, um Rachel, your daughter, so then he might switch, you know, like rename Leah Rachel and Rachel Leah, switch the names and then switch this. So he made sure to make it very specific which one he wanted. We'll see it didn't work anyway, but he at least tried. So in verse 19, Lavan said, it is better that I give her to you than I give her to another man. Remain with me. What is so? Um, Yaakov worked for seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him a few days because of his love for her. So what does that mean? It's better that I give her to you than I give her to another man. I mean, he's working. First of all, he's not giving him. He's Yaakov's working for seven years for her. And like, it's better for, you know, you than someone else. So here also, the Archaim says that Lavan was working in Engel. In his deceit, he was saying, it's better I give her to you. He was implying that it's a gift. A gift could be, you know, if you t- promise a gift, you could just change your mind on that. If someone, so he would, he was trying, kind of making a statement that is not really, I'm paying you for your work, but, you know, you're working as payment for the, for her at like the condition or the dowry, whatever it is, that you're working towards getting her. You're working, I'm giving it her to you. It's a, I'm, 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 I'm promising you her to you as a gift. And remain with me. And you're working because you're, you know, you're, you're staying with me. And when you're staying with you, it's the right thing to do. You don't freeload. When you're staying with someone, you should help out. So that's why you're working. So he was kind of like hinting at that, trying to lay a foundation for some deceit. Okay, and then it says they seemed to him a few days because of his love for her. So usually people say that like it feels like forever. You know, like you have to wait, your person loves a woman and they has to wait three months to till the wedding. It feels like forever. What does it mean it felt like a few days? So the um the Sforno explains that what he means is that the working for seven years is that's seven years of work. That sounds like a lot, but for the the amount that he valued Rachel, seven years of work just felt like a few days of work. That he wasn't, it didn't feel like he was overpaying. Okay, so in verse 21, Yaakov said to Levin, deliver my wife for my term is fulfilled and I will consort with her. All the commentaries ask, what kind of person talks like that? Deliver my wife for my term is fulfilled and I'll consort with her. Everyone understands what you know, what happens after a wedding, but it's not something that people say out loud. That's a very um, grotesque thing to say. And so the um, the primary, the commentary say that he's been working for seven years for her and he knew what his mission was when this marriage. His mission was to be the father of the Jewish people. And that was delayed and delayed and delayed by love. And he said, I have to get on with that. I have to start building the, I have to start building the Jewish people. So That's the, yeah, and he was old. Yes, he was an old man already. What was he doing when he was younger? He was studying in his father's house, and the Medrash actually says that he stopped along the way and studied in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. He was, he was um, working on his personal growth. Okay. Yes. So, the um, who right. so that. He would meet somebody younger right. when he was young. Yeah. The who was it that I saw? I think it was the Arachaim. Actually, gives an interesting. This is a more technical answer, and that is that the Mishnah says there are three ways to affect a marriage, a kedushin, a betrothal, to betroth the woman. For a man to betroth the woman, there are three ways. One is to give her something of value, and that's the way that we do it. Is that we give a ring? The ring has to have have value. And we say, I betrothed you with this ring. Behold, I betrothed you with this ring. Kedas Moshe Israel, like the laws of Moshe and Israel. And that by giving her something of value and her accepting it, that affects the betrothal. There's, um, that's the first way. The second way is through a contract, a document. That you could write out a document that by way of this document, similar to get, but the opposite is that a get and a marriage is ended by the husband giving the wife a document, but that through this document, a divorce is affected with a lot more, but that's the gist of it. And here it's through this document, the 
marriage should be, the betrothal should be affected. And he gives the document. Well, it's not the ksuba, though. A ksuba is a contract delineating responsibilities of the marriage. This is a contract that will actually bring about the marriage. They'll cause the marriage to be. Yeah, so that that we we don't do this. We we give the ring instead. Right. But this is another way to do it. If a person would okay. like to do it that way, and the third way is through an act of intimacy. And um, and that's a third way by which, if they actually engage in an act of marital intimacy with intention of affecting a betrothal, that that makes the betrothal. So the Arachayim says here technically. His kedushin, the what, what he was paying, was the work that he did. And he's saying, paying paying for work, when a person works, that causes the other person to owe them money, owe them the salary. And a person can't, kedushin, basically a betrothal, can't be affected, can't be caused by that. It has to be something tangible given, not, I worked, you owe me money, and that owed money will be the betrothal. That's not how it works. That can't affect, that can't cause them a betrothal. So he was saying, instead, he was saying, um, give me Rachel so I will consort with her, meaning that's the way that it will affect, cause the, the betrothal. That's just, just an interesting technical um, perspective from the Arachayim. Okay. So, and um, it wasn't the, so what happens? So in verse 22, Lavan gathered all the people of the place, made a feast. It was in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he consorted with her. Okay, he pulled the switcheroo. It was supposed to be Rachel. He worked seven years for Rachel, and it's Leah. It's uh, her sister. So, where are we? In verse 24, and Lavid gave, gave her Zilpa, his maidservant, and maidservant to Leah, his daughter. And we'll see later, the Ramban comments, that um, Zilpa was um, was younger. She was she was young and 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 that kind of made it seem that it was Rachel because they would give the younger maid servant to the younger. Uh, the, uh, the yes, yes, we'll get there. Okay, and it was in the in verse 25, and it was in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And the commentaries say it was in the morning, behold, it was Leah. That implies that at night it was Rachel. And the Medrash says that, that Rachel, in fact, like hid in the room so Yaakov wouldn't recognize that the voice was Leah because then she would be completely ashamed. If he would like realize it was Leah, not, not Rachel, and he got angry and kicked her, whatever, it could cause her tremendous shame. Yes. Yes. So this is why at, uh, at the um, Badakin, at the wedding, the chassan looks under the veil. <laughs> Make sure it's the right person. Okay. Yes. Can I ask you a question real quick? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, tell, tell me again why he didn't want Rachel to marry. Why yeah. Levin didn't? Um, yeah. I didn't, um, I've seen in some of the commentaries that, again, he was a con man and he saw a chance to get more money out of out of Yaakov. Meaning that ya he knew Yaakov wanted Rachel. So if he gives Leah, then Yaakov's going to work again for Rachel. So that way he could make more money off of it. It's like okay, upsell. Thank you. Get another sell. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. So, um, in verse 25, and he said, so he said to Lovin, what is this you have done to me? Was it not Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? And Lovin said, such is not done in our place to give the younger before the elder. Complete the week of this one and we'll give you the other one too for the work which you performed to me. For me, yet another seven years. So the commentaries ask, what's his answer? That um, we don't give the younger before the elder. But we agreed on Rachel. So how are you giving me Leah? That wasn't what we agreed on. So um, the commentaries say that what Lavin was saying is that you wanted Rachel, but there are two ways that that could happen. Since the custom was that um, since the custom was that you, you, the, the younger one doesn't marry before the older one marries, so there's two ways that could happen. You marry Rachel. Either you wait until Leah is married, then you marry Rachel, or you marry Leah and then you marry Rachel. You can marry both. And that way, they, they, you have, however it is that you have to ensure that the older one gets married first. So he said that until now, we were waiting. But when you said, give me my wife so I could, could you, you want to get married now? Oh, he was, yeah. He was a smart one too. Yeah. She explained to someone else. Yeah. 
always uh, attack. Always the best defense is a good offense. He's always on the offense. So he was saying. So he was saying when you said you want to get married now, there's only one way that could happen. Because implied in that was that you have to marry Leah first. So we gave her Leah. Okay. <coughs> So he said, complete for, in the top of 153, verse 27, complete this week for this one. Of this one, we'll give you the other one too for the work which you will perform for me yet another seven years. So now he's getting um, another seven years of work out of it. He's saying, you're going to work another seven years. But what he, and so he did give Yaakov something, and that is he didn't have to wait till after the work, to marry, after the seven years to marry Rachel. He was able, he um, finished the seven days of rejoicing and then was married Rachel. So that's what he did. He gave him Rachel's daughter to him as a wife. Verse 27, love and gave Rachel's daughter Bilhaz, his maidservant to her as a maidservant. He consorted also with Rachel and loved Rachel even more than Leah, and he worked for him yet another seven years. And then in verse 31, Hashem saw that Leah was unloved, so he opened her womb, but Rachel remained barren. So the commentaries ask that it says in verse 30 that he loved Rachel even more than Leah. That implies he loved Leah. He loved Rachel even more. Then it says in verse 31, Hashem saw that Leah was unloved. The Hebrew there is even, the art school translates, the Hebrew is a little more severe. It says that snua Leah, that she's hated. It seems very different from not that the other ones loved more. Wait, 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 okay. Let's go back to the previous yeah. verse. He consorted also with Rob. Yeah. So he was consorting with her while he was married to Leah. Did in wasn't married to Ruffle yet. Yes, he was. At this this is so Lavin said, um oh, where am yeah. I? <laughs> and he gave Rachel to his daughter Tim as wife in verse 28. Yeah. And this polygamy was accepted back then. Right. And it was actually polygamy is against the halacha in Judaism as it was enacted by Rabbeinu Gershom, who was an early leader of Ashkenazic Jewry. I would say in the year 1,000, 1,100, somewhere around there. One of those centuries, like 1,000 to 1,100. Um, and that's when it was banned. And it was banned for societal reasons. It was, meaning it's not like something immorally against halacha. It was banned because of its, it was destructive to society. And, um, and and because it was that the ban was enacted by Rabbeinu Gershom, who was the leader of Ashkenazic Jewry, it wasn't even accepted in the Sephardic communities immediately, and that was adopted over time. And there might even be communities where where it was never accepted. I think like the Yemenite communities were kind of disconnected <coughs> from the other Jewish communities, and actually have a had a stronger tradition from. Um, the times of the Beis Hamikdash, even because they were exiled and were disconnected from all the developments in the other communities, so they might not have accepted it until very recently, if at all. Meaning, they might do it because that's what's accepted by society, but not as a halacha. Okay, um, so where are we? Oh, so the council so where it's it says that Hashem loved Rachel more than um, Le Rachel even more than Leah, and then it says that Hashem said that Leah was unloved or hated. So the commentaries say that for a woman, a husband loving someone else more than them is hatred. That from to, from their perspective, that's hatred. So Hashem opened Leah's womb, but Rachel remained barren. Leah had a son called Ruvain, which means Hashem has discerned Ruvain. He saw and gave me a son. Now my husband will love me. She conceived again and had a son named Shema. She named him Shimon, that um, Hashem heard. Then in verse 34, he, she, again she conceived and had bore a son and they said, this time my husband will be attached to me and called him Levi. And verse 35, she conceived again and bore a son, declared this time, let me be gra grateful, praise Hashem, call his name Yehuda. And then she stopped giving birth. So she had four sons, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda. Chapter 30, Rachel saw that she had not borne children to Yaakov, so Rachel became envious of her sister, and she said to Yaakov on page 155, give me children, otherwise I am dead. Like, my life has no meaning. Without children, I'm going to die. Yaakov's anger flared against Rachel, and he said, am I instead of God who has withheld from you fruit of the womb? Okay, so this conversation is very interesting, that the commentaries say, the Medrash says, that Yaakov was punished for this that she got his anger, he answered angrily to women in pain. 
And it says, because of this, all of his other sons um, ended up bowing down in subjugation to the son of Rachel, to Yosef. And um, that was a result of this anger that he that he demonstrated towards her when she was in pain. But um, um, but she was asking she she was asking him to daven, but he was saying, "I can't guarantee an answer. I could daven Tashem, but I can't guarantee. I can't force God's hand." Okay, so what did she do in verse three? She said, "Here is my maid Bilha, consort with her that she may bear upon my knees, and I too may be built up to her." I saw in the commentary, some of the commentaries say that she was concerned that the reason why children were being withheld from her is because of her jealousy of her sister. That she was, that um, that, that was a flaw in her character that was causing her to be childless. So she tried to fight against that by even giving her maidservant to Yaakov as a wife, thereby, um, you know, going, going the opposite, acting opposite of this flaw in her character. So, what? So with that, so in verse four, she gave him Bila, her maidservant, as a wife. And verse five, Bila conceived a boy Yaakov a son, and Rachel said, "God has judged me that He has not given me a son, but He even gave my maidservant. He heard my voice, given me a son, so for me." And she called his name Dun. And all then he had um, another, she had another um, Bila had another son named Naphtali. So Bila had Dun and Naphtali. And then in verse 9, when Leah saw she had stopped giving birth, she took Zilpah, her maidservant, and gave her to Yaakov, his wife. Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, bore Yaakov, his son. Leah declared, good luck has come. She called his name Gud. It was like good fortune that he had a son. She had a son. And she bore a second son. And she said, in my good fortune, for women have deemed me fortunate, so she called his name Asher. The commentaries comment that and I think this is the Ramban, that by all the sons, all the children born, it said that they conceived and bore a son. And um, um, if you look in verse 31, 32, Leah conceived and bore a son. For 33, again she conceived, again she conceived, she conceived again. Then with, um, Bil with Bilha, on page 155, verse 5, Bilha conceived and bore a son in verse 7. Bill is um, conceived again and bore Yaakov a second son. By Zilpah, it doesn't say that. By Zilpah, it says in verse 10, Zilpah lays more maidservant and bore Yaakov a son. And again, in verse 12, bore a second son to Yaakov. It doesn't say she conceived at all. It never says that by Zilpah. And the commentaries say that this is because she was young, that she was the youngest of all the wives. And the, when they're very young, it's sometimes not apparent that they're, Pregnant till late, very late, and that's why it doesn't say she because they didn't know that she didn't. They didn't know that she had conceived until a short time before she gave birth. And I think that's also why it says that it's like good fortune had come with, with God's like it's, it's like good fortune that it was like a surprise that Zopa had a son. Okay, then there was an incident in verse fourteen. Reuven went out in the days of the wheat harvest. He found Dudaim in the fields and brought them to Leah's mother. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your sons to dime. But she said to her, was you're taking my husband insignificant and now you even take my sons to dime? Okay, so what are these do dime? The Ramban brings an opinion from Rashi that it's Jasmine and he disagrees with that. And he brings um, other commentaries that have been Ezra, I think from Unculus, the um, Aramaic translation of the Torah, is that it is, what do they call that stuff? Um, it says here, violence, mandrakes, and bad Mandrake. That's it, mandrakes. Mandrake is... It's like a root that's right. supposed to look like a man. Right. It's called mandrake. The root looks like a man. Um, the Ramban, though, and the, the, they say that, like, it's supposed to bring, um, it's supposed to bring child, it's supposed to help, help with fertility. It's like an herb that they use to help with fertility. The Ramban, though, says he's never seen that in any medical textbook. <laughs> And um, that it, that it works for fertility, and um, and he said if it does, it's some kind of segula. It's not like a medically sound practice. But he says the Ramban really understands that the idea was that it was just something for her to to um, you know like she didn't have children, and Leah had her sons bringing her flowers, bringing her these fine smelling stuff to for the house, and she wanted that. And um, so when she asked if she could have it, then. Rachel, then Leah says, like, you took my husband. Remember, Leah married him first. So it's like, and you took my husband and like, and he doesn't love me anymore because he loves you. And now you're going to take my son's stuff too. 
And Rachel said, therefore, he shall lie with you tonight in return for your sons to die. Okay. So when Yaakov came from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him and they had the exchange. And now Leah had more children. That um, she um, bore Yaakov a fifth son and named him Yisachar. And then Leah had a sixth son named um, Zavulan. So those are Leah's sons so far, are Reuben, Shem, and Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zavulan. Bilha had Dan and Naftali. Zilpa has got an Asher. That's where we're holding with the sons of Yaakov at this point. Um, afterwards, in verse 21, she bore him a daughter and she called his, her name Dina. So in verse 22, Hashem remembered Rachel. God hearkened her. He opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. So she called his name Yosef, saying, May Hashem add on for me another son. So now Rachel has her first son, and now we have Yosef. <clears throat> in verse 25, And it was when Rachel had given birth to Yosef, Yaakov said to love and grant me leave that I may go to my place and to my land. Give me my wives and my children for you, that I have served you. I will go for you aware of my service that I labored for you. So the commentaries comment that it seems that there's a connection between the birth of Yosef and him departing. That it says, when Yosef was born, he said to love and let me leave. What's the connection? Why is it like Yosef's birth was a trigger for that? So the Medrash says that if you look at, it's not this week's Haftarah, it's actually next week's Haftarah, is the entire book of Ovadia. It's not long. But um, the Haftarah for Vayishlach, it's in the Art School Stone Chumash. It's on page 1141. It begins. Page 1141. Next week's Haftarah, the Haftarah for Vayishlach. And like I said, it's the entire book of Avadya. Um, it's actually on 1142 is the part that I'm going to read, starting from verse 17. So next week's Parsha is where you have that climactic encounter between Yaakov and Esav after Yaakov had left Lava. But And it says, but so in the prophet Ovadia says in verse 17 on page 1142, but on Mount Zion, there shall be a remnant and it shall become holy and the house of Yaakov will inherit its inheritors. The house of Yaakov will be a fire and the house of Yosef a flame and the house of Esav like straw. They will kindle among them, consume them, and there'll be no survivor of the house of Esav for Hashem has spoken. So the prophet compares the house of Yosef to fire. I'm sorry, the house of Yosef to flame. That a fire here is usually understood as like a coal. That, um, and the house of Yosef is the flame. And Esav is like straw. Meaning that Esav has, I mean, Yaak, Yosef specifically has some power to stand up to Esav. More than the other brothers, Yosef is like a flame to Esav's straw. That like he's kind of Esav's, he, his, he's Esav's weakness. Weakness. So once, so until now, remember, ya Yaakov was staying by Lavan as as refuge um, from a sanctuary from Esav. Once Yosef was born, he said, "Now I could I could leave, because I don't have to fear Esav anymore. I have Yosef, and Yosef has that power over Esav." <coughs> yeah, interestingly, I say to say that there's two Mashiachs really. There's Mashiach ben David, the Mashiach from the David is from the tribe of Yehuda. But there's also Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach from the house of Yosef, who will begin the redemption. And um, that's, he will fight against Esau, because like we said, somehow Yosef is able to fight against Esau more than any of the other tribes. Because it says here that you know, Esau will be consumed, but yes. it's still around, right? Well, no. That hasn't happened yet. This is a, a prophecy for the future, that Yosef will overcome Esau. And that's the entire book of that's the entire book of, 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 of Vadya, yeah. It's a short book of the prophets. It's from the 12, there's a treyasa, the 12. They call them minor prophets just because they're shorter. But um, they're not minor in prophecy. But um, yeah, Avadya, th that's the entire book of Avadya. Okay, so once Yosef was born, he's ready to leave. They negotiate... Um, so in 159, verse 27, Beloved said to him, if I found favor in your eyes, I've learned by divination that Hashem has blessed me on account of you. He knows that he was blessed by virtue of Yaakov being there. And he said, specify your wage to me and I'll give it. And so he said, I want you to stay. So just tell me what, what just name your price. I'll pay it as long as you stay here and continue working for me. Um. 
So um, Yaakov said in verse 31, he said, what shall I give you? And Yaakov said, do not give me anything. If you'll do this thing for me, I will resume pasturing, guarding your flock. Let me pass through your whole flock today. Remove from there every speckled or spotted lamb, every brownish lamb among the sheep, spotted and speckled among go the goats. That'll be my wage. Meaning, take all of those that are different, really, like the brownish, the speckled, the spotted, and take them out. And any that are born anew from the flock will be mine. Meaning, anyone that are genetically disposed in that direction, he said, take away. So, and any that are born subsequently will belong to Yaakov. And um, Levin agreed, and that's what they did. And in verse 37, on the bottom of 159, Yaakov then took for himself fresh rods of poplar, hazel, and chestnut. He peeled the white streaks in them, laying bare the white of the rods, and set up the rods which he had peeled in the brunnels, and the watering receptacles to which the flocks came to drink. So he made, um, like, had rods to which um, white streaks in them. Then he made white streaks, and so that's what they saw and um, that, and because they would see that, that would somehow influence how their babies were born. And um, and and he, he and they saw that while they were mating, and that would influence the um, what the babies were. And um, it says that um, in verse thirty four, the man became exceedingly prosperous. He attained whatever lots of flocks, made servants, servants, camels, and donkeys. So he became very wealthy through this. And in chapter 31 on page 161, then he heard the words of Lovin's son saying, Yaakov has taken all of the what that belonged to our father, and from that which belonged to our father, he amassed all his wealth. So he starts hearing that they're talking about him as a parasite. And the Ramban points out that earlier in the Parsha, we saw that Rachel was shepherding the flocks. What's Rachel doing? What's his daughter doing as the shepherd? If not, he didn't have any sons. That was his, Rachel was his daughter was shepherding because he didn't have any sons. Now it's saying he heard the words of love and sons. Now he had sons. And he says, this is an example of the blessing that came to love and on account of Yaakov being there, that even he was blessed with children. Okay. So Yaakov also in verse two noticed Levin's disposition that behold it was not towards him as in earlier days. That son said to Yaakov, return to the land of your father's your native land, I will be with you. And he consulted with his wives and it's it says in verse six, now you have known that it was with all my might that I served your father, yet your father mocked me and changed my wage a hundred times. That the commentaries say that it wasn't just they agreed on they had one agreement and um and as to which sheep, which signs of the sheep would be Yaakov's, and that's what that was it. Lavan kept on changing. Lavan kept on saying, you know, no, no, we agreed on uh, the we agreed on the striped ones, not the spotted ones. And, you know, it kept on changing the agreement slightly. Yeah, exactly. Once again, he was a con man working in angle. But God did not permit him to hard me. If he, And as it continues in verse 8, on page 163, if he would stipulate speckled ones shall be your wages and the entire flock were speckled ones. And if he would stipulate ringed ones shall be your ring wages and the entire flock were ringed ones. And he kept on changing, moving the goalposts, like you're saying, and whatever he did, whatever he said would be Yaakov's wages came to pass. Thus God took away your father's livestock and gave it to me. And um, okay, and he saw like angels causing that to be a take it to, to, to happen. And uh, God told me to return. And in verse 14, then Rachel and Leah replied and said to him, have, or, have we then still a share and in an inheritance in our father's house? Are we not considered him as strangers? For he had sold us and even totally consumed our money. But all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us, to our children. And now whatever God has said to you, do. Meaning we're Detached from our father, we're your family now. <coughs> so he arose and took all his wealth and fled in like in the middle of the night to go to the land of Canaan as Lovin had gone to share the sheep. Rachel stole the trophim that belonged to his father. The, the disagreeing what exactly this was, if it was uh, some idols of his or anything. The robot says it was like oracles of Lovin that he used to divine Okay, and Lavan deceived Lavan, Yaakov in verse 20, Yaakov deceived Lavan the Armenian by not telling him that he was fleeing. Now it's Yaakov's turn to turn to deceive Lavan. After all the deception that Lavan pulled on Yaakov, ya um, Yaakov had uh, went when Lavan was shearing his sheep, Yaakov left with the entire family and all is well. If he crossed the river, says direction towards Mount Gilead, and Lavan heard and he started pursuing them, 
But in verse 24, but God had come to love in the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, beware lest you will speak with love in either good or bad. He's saying, don't even think of touching him. So he caught up. And in verse 26, Lavan said to Yaakov, what have you done that you have deceived me and led my daughters away like captives of the sword? Why have you fled so stealthily and cheated me? Nor do you tell me, for I would have set you off with gladness, with song, with timbre, with lyre. If you would have just told me you were leaving, I would have made a grand, grand old celebration of you and a great uh, uh, party. And you did not even allow me to kiss my sons and daughters. Now you have acted foolishly. It is in my power to do you all harm. But the God of your father addressed me last night, saying, beware of speaking with Yaakov, either good or bad. He's like, you know, I would, uh, what I would do to you if I, you know, wasn't so righteous. Now you have left me and you stole my truffin, so he went looking for them and couldn't find them. And then on page 167, verse 36, then Yaakov became angered and he took up his grievance with Lavan. Yaakov spoke up and said to Lavan, what is my transgression? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? When you rummaged through all my things, what did you find of all your household objects? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen and let them decide between the two of us. And he said, these 20 years I worked diligently for you. And um, he says in verse 42, um, had not the God of my father, the God of Avram, the dread of Yitzchak been with me, you would have surely have now sent me away empty-handed. God saw my wretchedness and the toil of my hands, so he admonished you last night. So after all of this, Yaakov laying out all of his, um, the truth of, the, of what happened, what does Lavan say in verse 43? Then Lavan spoke up and said to Yaakov, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flock is my flock, all that you see is mine. After all the truth laid out for him, he's just in denial and just denies everything. Attack, attack. Like you said, all the best defense is a good offense. He's attacking. Everything you have is mine. Yet to my daughters, what can I do to them this day or to their children whom they have born? They're, you know, at the end of the day, they're my children. They're my grandchildren. So now come, at, come let us make a covenant and I, I and you and it shall be a witness between me and you. So, of course, he has to be the uh, righteous one, the... Um, What's the word? He's like the uh, the um the father-in-law from you know from Gehenna, <laughs> and uh, but it's he say he says you know at the end of the day it's my daughters and my grandchildren so I can't do anything. So in verse forty-five, then Yaakov took a stone, raised it up as a monument, and Yaakov said to his brethren, "Gather stones." So they took stones made a mound, and they ate there on the mound. Yeah, love and called it um um Yagar Sadusa. But Yaakov call it Galate, which actually are equivalents. It's interesting that Yagar Sadusa is Aramaic. It is Galate means a um as a testimony pile, like a, a pile of rocks as a testimony. Once Aramaic, the language of the Arameans of Lavan, and once Hebrew, the language of Yaakov. Yeah. And um in verse 48, then Lavan declared, This man is a witness between me and you today, therefore he called it in Galate. And as for mitzvah, because he had said, may Hashem keep watch between me and you and we are out of each other's sights. And if you will ill treat my daughters, or you will marry wives in addition to my daughters, then no man may be among us. But see, God is a witness between me and you. And Lovin said, Yaakov, here is this mound, and here is this monument which I have cast between me and you. This mound shall be witness. And the monument shall be witness. I cry not cross over you past this mound, nor may you cross over to me past this mound. May this monument be for evil. In verse 53 on page 169, May the God of Avram and the God of Nachor judge between us, the God of their father. And Yaakov swore by the dread of his father, Yitzchak. So I heard from my father, and afterwards I actually found this in, um, from Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, that he comments that in the Haggadah, uh, we do on Pesach at the Seder, so it says an Aramean tried to destroy my forefather. Right. And it says that's referring to the love and tried to destroy Yaakov. Where do we find love in trying to destroy Yaakov? We well, keep swindling him. But... He keeps swindling him, but that's you know trying to take money from him. He's trying to rip him off. Cool. Where do you find try find him trying to destroy him? So, I heard from my father and also from uh, afterwards found Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky that this is the moment where he tried to destroy him. That he said, "May the God of Avram and the God of Nachor judge between us." The God of Avram is Hashem. The God of Nachar is the idolatry of Terach. He was trying to get Avram to agree to that oath, which would introduce some level of idolatry into the foundation of the Jewish people. That he was trying to have Yaakov to agree, yes, 
And that that would mean that Yaakov is swearing by an idolatrous deity, the right. god of Nachar. And just he was oh, the comment, just trying to sneak it in, introduce something rotten in the foundation of the Jewish people. And um thereby try to destroy the whole thing. And Yaakov saw that and he swore by the dread of his father Yitzchak. He avoided the whole thing. And okay, but then he slaughtered a, a feast and they um, broke bread together and spent the night. And in the Parsha ends, 169, chapter 32. And Lavan awoke early, awoke early in the morning, he kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Lavan went and returned to his place. Yaakov went to, on his way and angels of Hashem encountered him. Yaakov said when he saw them, this is a godly camp. So he called the land of that place Machanayim. And that Machanayim literally means a pair of camps. And there were these angels. And this kind of connects to the end of the Pasha, to the beginning of the Pasha. We said the Medrash that the angels going up and coming down the ladder were the angels of the land of Israel ascending and the angels of Gullus, of Chutzlar, of outside Israel descending. Now it's the opposite. He sees these troops of angels and calls a place the pair of troops of angels because he has the, now the angels that accompanied him and Chutzlar is accompanying him and, and Aram are leaving and the angels as he's preparing to enter Israel are joining him. Going up and down the yeah. Is there any connection with that with Yosef's dream? Isn't Yosef's dream going up and down? No. No. Yosef's dream. No, Yosef had two dreams. Yosef's dreams were one with um, all the sheaves, the, the sheaves of grain bowing down to his oh, sheaf right. of grain and there was the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him. Right. But not, not the, the latter was Yaakov's dream. With God. Yeah. Keshkoyach, everybody have a great Shabbos.